It's good to see you all. Um, I wanted to uh, give people a few minutes to get from the plenary to this session, if they're coming. Um, so we'll just wait a couple more minutes. In the chat box, I will be, how do I send a message to everybody? I'm gonna share a link for uh, a live survey that we're gonna do together. So I'll send you the link now in case you wanna open it up on your phone or browser. And if I can get a couple of folks to just confirm that the link works for you by saying it works in the chat box, that would be super helpful. All right, looks like it works. People are, people are here for it. Oh, a number of familiar faces. I'm so happy to see you all uh, joining us today. We're just gonna give it two more minutes for people to join. While we're waiting for people to join, um, I'd love for everyone to share in the chat box one word to describe how they're feeling so far. Ooh, that's a feeling. I'll take it. Uh, Travis Shaw says, my audio says I need to call a number. Um, my understanding is you don't instead, I think you need to connect to audio, but I'm going to leave it to someone else who's, who's handling the tech to respond to you. Intrigued. Ah, okay. The ooh is a whale feeling. Thanks for clarifying Tyson. Motivated at the end of a Friday. That's wild. Hopeful. Just Greg, feeling about how you're feeling today at the end of three days of summit. Ah, fantastic. Okay, I love that. <laughs> All right, so for the new folks who joined, I'm sharing a link in the chat box. I'd love for you to queue that up um, on your phone. You'll need access to Wi Fi or data so that you can do our live survey. So it looks like most people have, it looks like most people have joined us so far. And just to give you a heads up, I'm not gonna look at the chat box now for a little while, um, but I will come back to it at the end for questions and discussion. Um, but I won't be able to stop in the middle to, to look at what people are saying. All right, I'm gonna take us over to um, my slide deck. So welcome to this last presentation of the day called Ambiguous Feels, Ambiguous Pandemic Feels. My name is Raheem Thauer. My pronouns are he and him. I am a registered social worker in the province of Ontario and a psychotherapist. I'm currently working and living in, um, in Manitoba on Treaty 1 territory, also known as Winnipeg. Um, I'm really excited to be joining the summit virtually this year, although I am sad that we're not in Vancouver having cocktails but that's part of the feels. So today we're gonna to talk about um, our collective feelings, right? I often as a therapist get insight from my clients about what they're going through and I sure as hell know what I'm going through, but I wanna know what some of your own experiences have been. So we're gonna do the real-time survey in a moment and that's how we'll begin. Then we're gonna go into exploring this idea of ambiguous emotional experience and I'm gonna use case scenarios and questions to focus on the themes of risk, time, activism, and grief. And then we're gonna do a deep dive into the concept of grief. Not because I love grief, in fact, it is tormenting, um, but it's all around us and it's something I've been thinking about for several months through this pandemic. Um, and so I wanna explore it a little bit further um, and hopefully that'll dovetail into um, questions and discussion points people want to share. All right, so if you haven't already, go to ahaslides.com forward slash feels. And I 
am going to start that off. It looks like lots of people have had no trouble answering the first question. So if you haven't already, there's lots of time. Um, my initial response to self-isolation and quarantine measures included, check all that apply, anxiety about getting sick, fears of people close to me getting sick, appreciation for new time to catch up on projects, concern around employment and income, um, or a felt sense of a mini vacation. Now I'll warn you, some of you who are joining even a few minutes late, um, we have 50 people who can uh, participate. And I know that our room has over 50 people currently. So not everyone is necessarily gonna be participating in this survey, but thank you for responding. All right, we're gonna go to our next question. Esther Perel, for those of you who don't know, is a famous marriage and family therapist from Belgium based in New York City. She named our time in lockdown as the great adaptation. In which domains did you experience adaptation stress? So work in the front lines, work from home, living with roommates and family, living with partner, living alone, staying connected to people, understanding how to stay safe or nothing changed for me. All right, I think the fluctuation has stopped. This is like the US elections over here. Um, so working from home and staying connected to people seem to be the most distressing for people. It's hard to do, maybe there's lots of pressure. It requires a lot of adaptation. Understanding how to stay safe. Uh, I can't imagine the number of emails we've all sent and received where we said, oh, stay safe. And like, sure I can, and thank you for saying that, but it's hard to know what that means. Um, and the ambiguity of that, I think, is particularly stressful. Um, I appreciate that, you know, across the board, people are recognizing the challenge of adapting when you're living with roommates or family, partner or alone. Um, according to what we're seeing here, you know, none of them are necessarily easy. And there are unique challenges for um, working on the front lines as well. In which domains did you experience adaptation growth? Now you've got the same options listed just in the bottom row. And you can of course pick multiple options. All right, so in some instances, I'm already seeing that things that required a moderate amount of um, stress to be endured had some of the biggest growth rates, like understanding how to stay safe and living with a partner and living alone. Those were like moderate before. Um, working from home and staying connected to people, those were demanded of us. Um, and they, there seems to be a high level of growth there as well. People who are working on the front lines also seem to have experienced quite a bit of growth in adapting to what that looked like. Thank you for that. Now the conditions produced by the pandemic affected my body image, positively, negatively, both, not at all. And rec I'm recognizing, I wanna recognize here that the conditions produced mean very different things to different people. All right, so for whatever it meant for you, All right. All right, it seems like an overwhelming number of people experience a negative impact on body image or both positive and negative, right? So when I combine those two, <coughs> I'm thinking about uh, the largest percentage of people in this, in this, lect uh, in this workshop. Um, there's a surprising number of people, surprising only to me, who say not at all. And I'm curious to know, what some of the resiliency factors were. And for the folks who said that their body image was affected positively, that's also very interesting. Um, all right, I'm gonna move to the next one. The conditions produced by the pandemic affected my relationship to drugs and alcohol, 
positively, negatively, both, not at all. And of course, it's going to be completely subjective. If you started to drink more and that made you feel great, you're welcome to say positively. Because I was one of those people. Okay, the overwhelming majority said not at all. This is another one that I'm actually quite surprised to see. Um, but I think I'm not surprised at the positively. Um, actually, you know what? If we add a positive, negative, and both, that is a, a large percentage of our group, actually. Um, so that's making a lot of sense to me. So what we're seeing from this survey, just to like spell it out a bit, about half of people say not at all, and another half of people say that they, you know, they engaged with their drug and alcohol use to some degree, right? It was either negative or positive. The conditions produced by the pandemic affected my relationship to my family of origin, positively, negatively, both or not at all. As the numbers climb, I'll just share, you know, some of my reflections from my therapy clients was people talking about the challenges of being forced to live at home or check in with their elderly family members more often, uh, even if they resented them or despised them or had a difficult relationship prior to. Other people had family members in nursing homes and weren't able to contact them for days on end. And that was extremely anxiety inducing. Um, and for other folks, they said, you know, our, our family just assumed that the distance meant we couldn't be in touch, but because everything moved to virtual platforms, we decided to connect with each other more often. And for them, it was positive. My sources of fear and anxiety during COVID-19 have included, and you can check all that apply, prolonged uncertainty, calculating my own risks, overworked essential workers, reports of deaths, prospects of being in a hospital alone and getting someone else sick. Which of these were sources of fear or anxiety for you personally? Okay, I'm just gonna comment on this briefly. I'm gonna start with calculating my own risks. Um, I think that's an incredibly challenging one, right? Once we get a handle on how COVID is spread, uh, you know, is it droplets, is it airborne? Um, then we have to figure out what constitutes a risk. So if I was in close proximity to somebody, if I got tired and took off my mask, is every time, is every time that I go grocery shopping with or without a mask, does that constitute a risk? So that becomes very challenging, right? Um, and we're going to go a lot deeper into prolonged uncertainty, but I'm, I'm really uh, appreciating people's response to that. Um, and the, the concerns around getting other people sick is something that really resonates with what Mark Gaspar's presentation uh, focused on yesterday as well. And there's a small but mighty group here that you know, are being honest and, and candid about their anxiety stemming from the reports of deaths, right? Um, and the prospect of being in hospital alone. I think for queer people, people who are HIV positive, people in same-sex relationships, um, all of that can be very challenging. The conditions produced by the pandemic affected my mental health, positively, negatively, both, not at all. All right, well, this explains why you all have come to this workshop, because we as a group have been going through it. Um, and so I, again, appreciate your honesty. And I have to say my motivation for doing a presentation like this was um, my own challenges with navigating um, so much all at once. Um, and it, it was a rare experience to be going through exactly some of the same conditions and experiences my clients were, right? And be, to be going through something um, with multiple communities, though it looks different with each community that I'm part of. The conditions of the COVID-19 pandemic brought up the following for me, loss in the present, past grief and rumination, extreme isolation, compulsive behavior, defiance and righteousness. That means like, I'll do what I want, 
body negativity, drug and alcohol dependency. And of course you can pick multiple options here. As I start to see the numbers climb, I'm, I'm so interested in people's experience. And I, I don't think we'll get to get in depth with everybody's experience in this session, but people's experience with past grief and rumination. I think a lot of people found a lot of newfound time without um, commutes, um, having to spend not cho like chosen time alone, but forced time alone. And we're thinking about past traumas, past relationships, what it would have been like to make something work potentially with a past partner. And I think the ambiguity of what people have been experiencing is what led to extreme isolation. I think it's very hard when people tell you how you're doing and you say, oh yeah, up and down, stop asking me. I don't know how to answer that question, right? To me, that speaks to the extreme isolation um, and the constant changing uh, state of what we're feeling in our bodies and loss in the present. We're gonna delve into that quite a bit later. And I really wanna appreciate people who are, are being honest and vulnerable with you know, saying, you know, I felt a bit defiance and righteous. I thought this wasn't gonna affect me. It has nothing to do with me, or I'll be fine. Or I've been through something like this before, or I've been through worse before and somehow I'll get through it. You know, there's a kind of righteousness. Um, and to share, you know, that you struggle with body negativity and also maybe challenges with drug and alcohol dependency. All right, let's shift the tone just a touch. When I learned that COVID-19 disproportionately affected poor Latinx and black communities, it confirmed what I already knew or I understood systemic racism better. I felt some emotional distance from the crisis, perhaps because you didn't feel implicated or directly affected, or I didn't know what to think or do. So what I like about this response is it really seems like, um, you know, being in lockdown and, and having no choice but to be facing the news every day, hour on the hour, while that wasn't positive for lots of people's mental health, uh, or, you know, we, we realized quickly it wasn't sustainable. There was lots of things staring us in the face. And I, I, I to take a silver lining approach um, or strengths-based approach, I think that we were able to build some bridges between people who knew a lot about systemic racism and others who um, needed the time and space to see it more clearly. My community provided or continues to provide specific supports for Black GBTQ folks acknowledging the impact of multiple pandemics. So either yes, virtual and in-person things are happening or were happening. No, it seemed like my community froze. All right, thanks for this. So what we're seeing as the numbers climb, uh, you know, is that for some, there's about 22% um, of people are saying that things were happening, right? And I wonder if those things were pre-existing, and you don't have to answer this now, and, and on this platform, you can't really, but um, were there things, was there a kind of community mobilization that had already existed um, that just needed to be launched or needed to be adapted? Um, because I, I suspect in cases where we weren't thinking about um, how HIV, STI, sexual health and mental health, um, how it impacts communities of color and in particular black communities, um, we might not have had some of that, some of that uh, groundwork in place. Now, this isn't to knock people who didn't have something in place or that you know, have lots of good ideas and resources, but feel like their community froze. I, I just wanna highlight that freezing is one of the normal responses to trauma, right? And when you feel shocked and helpless and unprepared, this is one of the things that can happen, right? So it's an opportunity to learn from something, but also to recognize that uh, just because nothing was happening doesn't mean that people don't care, but that um, people's nervous systems were overwhelmed and perhaps shut down. And that includes people that were service providers. 
I've argued in favor of police presence at Pride in the past. Yes or no? Now your name won't show up, so feel free to be honest about this. All right, so it's shaping up to be about 30% of people have said yes, um, and uh, about 70% are saying no. So I really appreciate your honesty here. Um, and I think for a long time, you know, our debate has, ha our, com our community conversations have been stifled or have had trouble getting through certain, um, uh, getting through certain barriers. So now ask, answer this question. Again, honestly, if I were asked my stance today, I would argue against police presence at Pride. Yes or no? And it's okay if you say no. Okay. Interestingly enough, the same stats um, as our previous slide. So I, it's hard to tell if this, if anybody who previously said um, uh, yes, they've argued for police presence is now saying um, that they've changed their stance. But from what it, it reads here, it seems like people have not changed their stance. Um, and that's it's kind of interesting to me, um, uh, particularly given some of the context of what we've been talking about in the summit. Um, and, and the, the intersection of politics we've been bringing forward. Uh, I just want to also say, I think, you know, this for a lot of, uh, black and indigenous people who are heavily surveilled, the response we see here, um, also constitutes and triggers a kind of grief, you know, for, for not being seen, not being heard. So. Living under multiple pandemics helped me understand the connection between systemic racism and LGBTQ issues. So disagree, I was already aware or agree, it opened my eyes. And you can also say not sure, I was checked out. Wow, it's almost equal parts disagree. I was already aware, agree it opened my eyes, so that's good. And the folks who were checked out, just do a simple scan, you know, as you think, you might already know why you were checked out, but what was going on for you? Um, were you overwhelmed? Were you grieving? Were you experiencing too many emotions? Um, were you in the defiance righteous headspace? Um, were you preoccupied um, with, with like other, uh, material losses like like loss of a job or fear that you were going to be evicted. Living under multiple pandemics left me feeling exhausted, spent, helpless, disoriented, depressed, inebriated, angry, hopeful for change, and tired. <laughs> Agree I was all over or disagree I was uh, slow and steady. Okay. So thank you. It seems like my suspicion has been confirmed that we were all over, meaning we were experiencing a lot of things, which makes it difficult to process. I often tell my clients, well, I also tell my friends and my family and anybody who will listen, that in any difficult situation, um, if we can first identify what we're feeling, we can then break down what it is we're thinking in relation to that feeling. Why am I feeling anxious? Why am I feeling worried? And then we can go from there and think about what we're going to do, what we can control, what we can't control. We can figure out what's our responsibility, what's not. But if you can't identify what you're feeling or you're feeling too many things at once, solutions or any kind of linear processing become quite challenging. Now, share one word that describes how you feel right now. After three days of the summit, talking about loss, talking about um, uh, ambiguous feelings, you can enter up to three words, but one word at a time. How are people feeling right now? And if you know how a word cloud works, the words that are biggest will be the ones that are repeated. Everyone can put in at least two words. That would be spectacular. Oh, 
All right, amazing. Oh, it's still going. This is quite a range of feelings. So I, I'm appreciating this and it's really giving me a sense of just the range where people are at. Of course, tired, uncertain and hopeful seem to be some of the biggest ones that are being repeated. Um, but of course, that doesn't that doesn't minimize, you know, the one people who are saying um, uncertain over it, bad, uh, pissed, proud, stimulated, not surprised, intrigued, um, etc. So take a moment to just take this in. Racially unwanted is one of them. All right, I'm gonna switch gears for us and I'm gonna now go back to uh, my PowerPoint. All right, so during epidemics, right, the number of people whose mental health is affected tends to be greater than the number of people affected by the infection. This is something that came out not too long after we went into lockdown here in North America, or at least in Canada. And it really got me thinking about um, the imprint this pandemic is gonna leave on us, not while, just while we're going through it, but long after it's gone, right? How are we gonna talk about the anxieties we had, the changes in life we made, the people we lost, um, the scares we had, uh, the economic uh, downturn that takes years to recover from. So I'm gonna go forward with four case scenarios. And each of these case scenarios is intended to highlight one example of um, ambiguous feeling. So Jonathan is 23 years old, lives with three roommates and has been having trouble making ends meet as an actor and artist in Toronto. He began working at a grocery store part-time in December, 2019. This wasn't a glamorous job, but he worked at the Loblaws in the village. So he ran into cuties here and there and he could pay his rent. Around March, 2020, he began to feel super anxious about risk for COVID-19 at his job. He was terrified of losing his job. So he kept his mouth shut for a while. Suddenly people were celebrating essential workers. This felt awkward for Jonathan, but he wasn't sure why. By May, he was feeling sex-starved, lonely and resentful that his three roommates each had at least a couple of casual partners over since the city went into lockdown. When the household had conversations about maintaining a bubble, it, was always, it always felt a bit unclear what the planning was based on, feelings, instincts, inclinations, public health guidelines, laws, symptoms, or arithmetic, sorry for the typos. This example really demonstrates the ambiguity of risk, right? So take a moment to soak that in and see if any of that resonates with your experience. And let's talk about the ambiguity of risk. Also, thank you, ACT, I stole that photo. Um, first, how do we attune to risk when we're not really honest about who is essential and who is not, right? Um, I think we confused uh, and we gaslighted some essential workers um, by not recognizing that they were lower paid and being relegated to jobs that other people don't wanna do in society, right? And so that doesn't make them essential, that makes them sacrificial. And that highlights for me class warfare, right? People who are afraid that they're going to be evicted, people who are at the mercy of landlords, people who are living paycheck to paycheck, um, you know, you can call them essential, but it might not land in the same way uh, we hope, right? And I bring this up not to undermine all, you know, the, the community rallying and the, the banging of the pots. To some degree, that can be helpful, that can be supportive. Uh, maybe some essential workers didn't mind the, the job that they were doing. Um, but if you're out all the time, and the state requires you to work and deems you essential, um, your risk or, or how you're seen as being exposed to risk 
um, is going to look different than other people, right? So the state is telling you, we think it's okay that you are exposed to risk to some degree. So what does that mean for how you internalize um, the cautions, uh, sorry, the precautions you have to take yourself um, as somebody navigating COVID-19? And the idea of masks can be a bit confusing because when I wear a mask, from what I understand, I'm protecting other people. But in order for me to be protected, they need to be wearing a mask. So the idea of masks only works if we all do it, right? And I think that becomes really challenging. Why? Because first of all, lots of people think that they're not gonna be affected until they are affected. Masks are incredibly uncomfortable until they weren't anyway. We got used to them or many of us got used to them. Um, we've always in our community thought about risk in terms of masculinity, or at the very least, those things have been intertwined, right? Taking risk is masculinizing, and um, it might feel embarrassing for us to be the first one to put on a mask, while others of us might say, you know what, whether you think you're at risk or not, just wear it as a show of solidarity, right? So people had different approaches to what the mask represented, whether they were going to wear it, whether they were not going to wear it. Um, and, and, and I would suggest in addition, um, it's interesting to think about what it meant, right? I'm a gay man. I remember going over to my uncle's house. I was wearing a mask because I took an Uber. And as soon as I walked in, he said, why are you wearing a mask? What do you need it for? What are you worried about? And I remember the rage filling up inside me because I thought I'm being confronted with a kind of hegemonic masculinity that very much has been, my gay community has been socialized into and has had to deal with. And I'm seeing it in how we are all congregating in spaces and not wearing masks, right? So I'm seeing how hegemonic masculinity trickles down into how we're able to even take care of ourselves and each other during a pandemic. And I can't help but wonder if PrEP set us up for failure, at least to some degree. I say this because as much as I love PrEP and I'm on PrEP and I take it daily, um, PrEP is an individual intervention. Um, if I'm HIV negative and I'm taking PrEP, then what I'm doing is being in charge of my own health. And as long as I take care of myself and I take my PrEP every day, I don't have to have conversations with other people about um, uh, their risk level necessarily or who their partners are or what their HIV status is, right? So PrEP becomes this very individualized way to approach risk reduction. And as much as it's good, I think it did not prepare us to have conversations around a different kind of epidemic, one that isn't individual, that has to be collective in nature, right? I remember some slogans that said, this is not our first rodeo. And I wondered how useful it could be to mobilize gay men in particular, to let them know that, hey, we've survived epidemics before. We, you know, we've lived through, we've lived through AIDS. We um, have lived through uh, regimes of intense um, homophobia. And I wondered, what does this message tell people? Does it say that A, we've lived through harder things and so we're gonna make it as a community this time around? Or does it say perhaps that we already have the tools to navigate risk management and we need to just apply our past calculations and our, our, previous, our previously acquired skills to a new, the context of a new pandemic. If it's the latter, I would be concerned. I also wonder if the idea from, you know, of bubbles, of safe bubbles, uh, community pods that people engage in, if they're inherently heteronormative. One of the things I think people really had a challenge with was thinking about what does it mean as a queer person who's living on their own or with their partner or multiple roommates uh, well into their 20s, 30s, and 40s or 50s um, living in the city and not the suburbs? What does a pot or a bubble mean to them? Perhaps they have a lifestyle where they're used to seeing uh, multiple groups of friends or people who belong to different groups many times a week. That looks very different um, than uh, a husband and a wife uh, and two kids who maybe interact with their neighbors or they get all of their emotional needs met or a, a significant amount of their needs met contained in their daily bubble, right? Are they already inherently in a bubble and now they just have to restrict what they do already uh, or maintain what they do already, right? That doesn't really translate for our communities. Let's move on to another example of ambiguity, 
Faisal, age 40, 42, loved his routine and he was tightening it up for 2020. A smoothie for breakfast, an audiobook for the commute to work, an evening gym sesh, a keto-friendly dinner, 10 p.m. jerk off, 10.30 lights out. When he heard about COVID, he thought, Wuhan is far away, I'm fine. And maybe a few weeks later, he thought, doesn't Italy have a large elderly population? I'll be fine. When COVID-19 hit Vancouver and Faisal started working from home, the routine went out the window. He thought of it as a mini reprieve from the world and embraced it. As the weeks went by, he began questioning if he was happy at his job. He wondered why he cared about going to the gym so much. He felt repulsed by the smoothies and craved artisan pastries in the morning. He stared endlessly outside his window, wondering if he could connect with his, if he should connect with his family of origin more frequently, how nice it would be to have a quarantine boyfriend, whether or not he felt connected to his home where the rent was exorbitant and what he wants his life to be. What's Faisal experiencing here? I would argue that he's experiencing the ambiguity of time. What do I mean by this? Well, in general, when we experience uncertainty, which a pandemic does bring, um, we're struggling with loss of control and autonomy, right? We don't know how to curate our lives, how to invest our energy, because we don't know what to expect. If you're somebody that like to buy a lot of clothes, now you're wondering, I could do that, but where am I going to wear those clothes? Or you were working on um, a degree program, you might certainly suddenly feel like, well, do I want to do this if it's online? What am I paying for? What is the point of this? Is this going to actually get me a job if we're going into a deep recession? So uncertainty brings out a sense of loss of control and autonomy. And that can be really discombobulating for human, humans. Now, when the concept of time changes for people, you may or may not have recognized that it changed for you, but I would argue that for a lot of people, the concept of time changed a little bit. Right. And I know from my time working at a sexual health clinic doing HIV testing, um, uh, one subpopulation and, and uh, research project I worked on was about people who were low risk, but had severe or high anxiety for HIV uh, acquisition. And what the research said was that when people are diagnosed with any kind of illness that they perceive to be terminal. Now, I know HIV isn't terminal present day, but anything that's perceived to be terminal, their sense of time changes because they tend to mobilize all of their emotional resources and sometimes financial or, or um, material. So like uh, how you spend your time, who you spend your time with, who, you know, the kinds of things you invest in. So there's a kind of emotional, intellectual, material resource mobilization that happens, right? And it's all geared toward safety, making the most out of your life and focusing on what's quote unquote important to you. So when we're living in a time of COVID-19 and lots of uncertainty and on the backdrop, if we feel like time has shifted how we see ourselves in the world, we might start to feel a lot of sadness, anxiety, and regret. So on the backdrop of ambiguous time, we might be thinking, I should have perhaps dated more. I, I should have put myself out more. I should have gone to that group. I should have, I should have, I should have. I had a friend who lived in the same building I did in Toronto, who during the pandemic lost three uncles, two in the United States and one in um, the UK. And he said, you know what, I, all I'm doing is spending time with family and all I can keep thinking about is how much I wasn't in touch with those people and now they're dead. And all I can think about is how hard it is um, to grieve in isolation. Ambiguity on the backdrop of this concept of, sorry, loss on the backdrop of an ambiguous time, uh, time map, it can lead to a lot of sadness because we think about all the things we've invested in, all the things our money has gone to, um, all the things we invest in day to day that maybe don't have as much meaning for us anymore. So you might look at, you know, the glass half full and say, this is a new opportunity for reflection and to reorganize and to see what's important. But you might also experience, you know, this tension around this is not just a great ad adaptation, but it's the great pause. Right. And that's I'm borrowing from somebody else. I didn't say that, but the great pause. And maybe that means 
it's a freezing of time where I can suddenly do more. I can be productive. I can pick up a new hobby. I can um, read more than I ever have. I can play a new instrument. But what if I also just want to do nothing? What if I feel completely immobilized, right? I think both things are valid. I think the world wants us to do more because we're indoctrinated into a capitalist world where uh, the, the capitalist machine says, if you're not doing more, you're not making good use of your time and it's wasted labor. But I think people who are trained to do more and get a lot done are mistaken for being seen as being super adaptive, right? I got a lot done, but that doesn't mean I'm super adaptive. It means that my nervous system got overwhelmed quickly. And instead of acknowledging what overwhelmed me, I went into productivity mode, right? So what I want to point out here is that the people who were super productive um, maybe missed certain things that were happening in their nervous system around being overwhelmed. And so they moved into uh, an action mode. And people who were doing nothing were perhaps overcome by what was going on in the nervous system and, um, uh, and couldn't gain couldn't garner the motivation to do the things that they used to be interested in doing. Now, is one better than the other? No, but the person who's doing more, you know, at some point needs to slow it down and the person who's doing nothing at some point needs to pick up the pace, right? Um, but nevertheless, um, the backdrop of time has really got, sorry, the concept of time has really got me thinking um, on the backdrop of this pandemic. Now, I wonder for, for a lot of gay men or queer guys, how did prolonged uncertainty affect or interact with your existing body image concerns? You'll know when you think about how your pride was, right? I know in the beginning of the pandemic, uh, lots of my clients were struggling with saying things like, oh, I, I don't get to exercise. I'm eating too much. I'm worried about gaining weight. I've ordered a lot of exercise equipment for home. And then the weeks and the months passed and we started to explore when you're always invested in your body and you're going to the gym, is it just for wellness? What else do you hope to get? And what benefits do you have when you maintain a certain physique? How is it linked to how you connect with the world, how you uh, market yourself as a sexual object uh, or a sexual being? And how was pride for you this year when you didn't have the usual um, emphasis on bodies that you normally have to grapple with? Were things easier for you? Were things harder for you? How did prolonged uncertainty interact with your drug and alcohol use? I ask this because I think we often, we have a routine of socially sanctioned use, right? Whatever you're using, um, you're likely plugged into a community that designates what the norms are for how often and how much you use, right? So let's say I just really love using ketamine on the weekends. Um, and that's my party drag and I really enjoy it by the way I do. But what happens when I'm working from home and I decide on a five o'clock on a Tuesday that this is gonna be a great choice? Maybe it is, right? I'm not saying that it's inherently a bad choice, but in the context of prolonged uncertainty and the ambiguity of time, I might start to see that the things I rely on to feel good are not just things that enhance my existing experience. They've become embedded tools that I use to manage grief, anxiety, and ambiguity. And that is a hard thing to realize. It was a hard thing to realize for me because I think in our culture, we really like to think that we're in control of our substance use. And it's hard to grapple with um, the reality that we may not be or to realize that it's actually something that's in our toolbox um, that we use alongside many other things to manage difficult emotions, right? Now, this is gonna be particularly difficult for people who are, before the pandemic felt like their substance use was very contained and regimented and uh, sanctioned in a way that, um, uh, that worked for them. And then it bled out of those boundaries later on. So I want you to reflect for a moment on you know, this idea of the ambiguity of time being really challenging for people because we need control and certainty to, to move forward. Consider how did you create control and certainty, right? I know for me, I, uh, I you know, I bleached my hair and I, I uh, obsessed about where to live and I moved from Toronto to Winnipeg. Did any of those things um, 
change anything to do with the pandemic? Of course not, but it gave me a sense of control. And so I did it. Gilles, age 33, is a white gay man who lives alone in a cute apartment and is doing his PhD at McGill, as one does for 10 years. He was feeling the ebb and flow of self-isolation measures during the first wave of COVID-19 from March to May, but he had a firm belief in collective health and well-being. This meant continuing to maintain his own quarantine measures because, as experts said, the goal as experts said, the goal isn't to just prevent the spread of the virus, it's to slow it down so our healthcare system doesn't get overwhelmed. And so that doctors don't have to be put in a position to, to decide who gets a ventilator and who does not. Unfortunately, Gilles' astute understanding and application of these principles alienated him from his friends. He would do virtual hangouts with, hangouts with them, but got really judgy when he heard of their partying and sexcapades. He decided to keep to himself for a while. On May 25th, Gilles saw the world turned upside down when he witnessed state-sanctioned murder on social media and an uprising in defense of black life. He fell into a deep emotional hole. And when he connected with his friends, he couldn't bear having conversations about systemic racism. I would say that Gilles was experiencing an ambiguity of what activism ought to look like. Let's delve in the, into this a bit deeper. I think that message, stay at, I stay at work for you, so you can stay at home, and you should stay at home for us. Really, um, really stood out to me during that time, and it really made me think about what does activism look like in this moment in time, or in these subsequent moments. So I think one of the challenging things for a lot of us, especially those who work in healthcare or um, HIV service organizations, those of us who are um, uh, community educators, you know, I think it's really challenging to synthesize a ton of new information while also doing community education. And how tricky is it or how challenging is it to wrap our minds around the idea that the COVID-19 pandemic to some degree requires or sends us a message to be stationary. Stay at home, don't leave, order your groceries or only leave for groceries, only leave for essential things. And another one says, you know what? Our people are dying. Police brutality in indigenous and black communities prevails and continues. We have to mobilize. We can mobilize virtually, but we also need to mobilize in person. And then there's the regulation of bodies, right? If I decide to give somebody a hug or I post on social media that I'm hanging out with, um, with some of my friends socially, um, there's lots of people who are on edge and their anxiety has been primed. And you know they might say, hey, you shouldn't do that. You really need to not touch people. You're setting a bad example. Stop posting this, stop doing this. Do you know the risk you're putting other people at? But a common argument might be, well, that's true. I'm putting other people at risk, but I think the regu you regulating my body isn't helpful, right? And we've been through this as gay men. Regulating our bodies produces shame and doesn't let us talk about risk or doesn't let us um, uh, talk about what calculated and informed risk looks like for us. So I think what gets entangled here is um, we, in these conversations, we revive a kind of oppression we've experienced as a community that's met with a kind of righteousness and entitlement. And it's really hard to know how to transform that into empowerment um, in terms of what are your rules? These are my rules. What are your boundaries? What feels safe for you? What are your rules based on? Um, how many people have you had that conversation with? Right? I think the regulation of bodies makes activism incredibly challenging. And then there's the digesting the realities of multiple pandemics. Um, you know, lots of folks on the front lines of this who just want desperation for change, right? They want to reform police systems. They want to abolish the police. Some of the things that they've been saying for a very long time, the world is only finally seeing um, and there's a frustration with people still trying to catch up, you know? And we think about activism and things like Blackout Tuesday, which on the one hand are very helpful, uh, but on the other hand, um, uh, you know, take away the, the very platform um, Black activists need to, to mobilize people, right? And then there's a lot of lateral um, conflict that we have in our communities about performative activism. And I think, it would be helpful if we could 
uh, think about, allow people to do the kind of activism that works for them, but also give them steps for what to do next. Um, because I think calling people out on their activism as being, and labeling as performative, I think also uh, shuts down our conversation and allows, uh, makes it difficult for people to, to work kind of in concert with one another. Here's my last scenario. Saeed, age 33, is an Ethiopian gay man in Ottawa who lives with his husband and their kind of snobby cat, Fallow. Saeed's partner is an essential worker and has been working throughout the pandemic. Saeed spent March and April being quite anxious about his partner's risk for COVID-19, but has been personally lucky enough to work from home. He can't help but think about what will happen if his partner gets sick. Then he gets sick and one of them ends up in hospital. Nevertheless, he has found comfort in cooking and holding a ritual cocktail hour with his partner. As the numbers went up in North America, Saeed grew increasingly disoriented as he heard about who was bearing the brunt of the COVID deaths. All he could focus on was work. All he could do was focus on work. He was a fundraiser at a nonprofit organization, but received notices about important functions being canceled all the way through to the end of summer. Unfortunately, he was laid off. This was a hard adjustment, particularly because it was all, always important for him to contribute to the home financially. When the murder of George Floyd sparked an uprising, Saeed's heart sank. He didn't see this as a spectacular moment for change because he knew more black lives were going to be lost. This is what I would call the ambiguity of grief. There's so many layers of grief here. There's anticipatory grief, there's ambiguous grief, there is actual very material loss in grief. Um, and then there is a kind of collective grief around um, the losses of black and brown lives due to COVID-19 and the loss of black and, and indigenous lives due to police brutality. So let's talk about loss and grief in our last 10 minutes here. Grief is a response to loss, right? And when we think about other emotional experiences we have like anxiety or depression, um, one of the things that makes them easier to work with is that we can identify them. We can, you know, there's clear triggers for what makes one anxious or feel depressed. And when we have predator, better predictability, we can think about how we want to prevent, manage, um, and move forward. But because grief is almost inherently ambiguous and amorphous in shape, it kind of shows up when it wants, which makes responding to it quite difficult. It shows up in a conversation, it shows up at a party, it shows up in a Zoom meeting, it shows up. Um, you know, after your third cocktail, when you thought you were having a great time. Now, recognizing that a pandemic is explicitly about loss, I think we have to acknowledge that the loss is not just physical and material, it's also intangible, right? The loss of normal. In March, there was an article, uh, you know, that talked about um, social distancing, this is not a snow day. And, and it really hit home for me very early on that everything being shut down doesn't mean I can have parties at home or I can hang out with people um, because those people, some of those people that are my friends anyway, had to go into work. And so they were at risk. And if they hung out with me, then I was at risk. And I realized this was gonna be um, a sequel of changes, of disconnection from people and also loss of all the important spaces to me, like frankly, you know, uh, bars, the workplace and any travel that I had planned. Anytime people say, you know, I've been up and down uh, I, and I heard that throughout, I still hear that today. How have you been? Oh, you know, up and down. There's good days and bad days. I think there was a point where people were experiencing a kind of smugness, you know, like I've got a handle on this. And then they get really surprised uh, where they're like, oh, I feel extreme disconnection or I'm sex starved. Um, and the grief of normalcy uh, and the grief of everyday life and what their life used to be really hits them. And then there's the anticipatory a grief of the greater loss has yet to come. Um, one of the things that spoke to anticipatory grief very well for me um, was something that, you know, uh, Esther Perel had said. And if you look her up, she, you know, she talked a lot about it. But if I were to give some examples of anticipatory grief, it would be what's the next thing I'm looking forward to that's going to be canceled. If I'm HIV positive and contract COVID, will I recover? And will I experience discrimination in hospital? Right? How will my loved ones grieve my loss? If I get COVID-19, I'll recover, but I dread being alone while sick. If I break quarantine, who can I tell and how will I be judged? 
And if my friends and family are vulnerable, right, I can't not think about possible fatality or how I will respond. So one of the things Esther said that really got me thinking about the language of working from home and really challenging it, um, because while I was working from home, my workload did not decrease. In fact, it increased and I was working 10 hour days uh, for several months in a row. Uh, and she says, you know, we're not working from home. We're trying to adapt to an entirely new worldview while working, learning, teaching, partnering, parenting, and more. On top of each other, in the midst of a global crisis, we're not tired, we're burned out. We're not waiting for things to return to normal. We're obsessing about what normal will even be after this. And for that matter, when is after going to come? So I'm not gonna go through this spectrum of a loss step-by-step, step, but I did a presentation from Max Ottawa and, um, I can't tell you exactly when, but I think it was in March or May. And I talked about this idea of a spectrum or progression of losses, right? And, and a lot of them were about um, intangible losses and some have to do with your daily routine. So if you think about an ecological model, the things in your sphere that affect you um, day to day, branching out to people you love, the institutions you rely on, all the way out to policies and, and the world you live in where you think about um, opportunity, the illusion of equality, the reality of labor exploitation. Um, and, and frankly, you know, I think about those trucks that were lined up outside a hospital in Queens, New York, with refrigerated trucks for, for, for dead bodies. And, and just letting it sink in what that could look like if that happened here uh, in Canada, which it very well could have and still could. Now, I don't have time to go into a lot of queer specific losses, but I think we know what they were, right? Um, queer owned businesses shut down. Uh, lots of trans people had their surgeries uh, delayed indefinitely, which is extremely difficult and, and challenging on the psyche. Um, people were worried about the loss of housing as soon as quarantine measures uh, would ease. And it's so hard to find a queer friendly employer or to adjust into a job that's queer friendly that I think people were really scared that if they lose their job, what would they even find when it comes after this, right? And, uh, you know, I heard a couple of people saying, well, you know, some of the friends I party with or I hang out with, if they were to die or they were to be in hospital, I don't think I'd be able to see them and I wouldn't be acknowledged as somebody that's part of their life. And I think queer people who have our own kinship models, um, you know, through casual sex, through chosen family, through our partying communities, those are legitimate kinship models. And um, we often experience disenfranchised grief because we're not recognized as being legitimate parts of those people's lives. Now, this is one of my last slides. Um, you know, the Kubler-Ross model that talks about the stages of grief has over and over, you know, by research been said to not be scientific and it's not always helpful. There's no stages for grief. And for me, I still think it's interesting, <laughs> right? So there's these stages of denial, anger, bargaining, uh, uh, sadness or depression and acceptance. And I think you can map it out onto some of our experiences throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and multiple pandemics, right? So the denial of this virus won't affect us or me, um, the anger you're making me st stay home and taking away my activities or my autonomy, and then there's this bargaining. If I do this, then this something else will be okay. There'll be a trade-off. If I social distance and use a mask, everything will be okay. If I just sleep for three more weeks, if I just drink myself silly for four more weeks, things will be different. Or I'll come out of this the other end a better person, or things will be over. Right? Those are bargaining examples. Sadness or depression. I don't know when this will end. I don't know what to do. I feel directionless. And then there's acceptance. This is happening. I have to figure out how to proceed. And I think for a lot of us, we jumped around and we continue to jump around between a lot of these experiences. I'm going to leave this slide and I'm going to thank you for your time. Uh, I know that you know I'm right at the hour, but because it's our last presentation of the day, um, I'm going to stop my screen share and invite folks to um, uh, share any comments and questions they might have. And I'm just going to pop out the chat box. Uh, I'm just scrolling through, just scrolling through. Um, I wish people could unmute themselves and tell me what they were saying. All right, so I'm just going to go through them real quick. We can unmute ourselves. Oh, Over, yeah. Mateo, oh my gosh, you can unmute yourself. I love that. Please do that. Yeah. And just 
jump out and talk because that way I don't have to, um, I don't, yeah, I don't have to do all the reading, which I don't want to do. Yeah. So bottom left corner, the little microphone picture for anyone who has a question for Lindsay. Okay. Ready, set, go. Well, I guess I can start then. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I've, I've listened to your talks now um, at a couple summits. And I mean, I appreciate you so much as I think the only trans POC psychologist that I know of in Alberta. It's mm -hmm. so important for me to hear perspectives from other queer or trans POC therapists. So that perspective is super appreciated, just from my my profession. In general, how do you, as someone coming from within your community, how do you work through the grief and potential traumas, sadness, anxiety, depression that you're hearing fed back to you? That are your, you know, some of it is your own story yes. from your clients. And, and how, like, what strategies do you have for listening, being present, but also dealing with your own stuff that comes up? Um, absolutely. Thank you. For, thank you for that, Mateo. Um, you know, I think part of it is first thinking about, okay, communities are going through a lot. What is my part and what is my role, right? Where is my energy best spent? Um, and when there was a lot of racial injustice going on, I know that as a South Asian person, uh, South Asian people are so super complicit in anti-Black racism um, and uh, are, you know, are pretty committed to the myth of the model minority and really are invested in being good citizens of the state. Um, and so I took that opportunity to do a lot of education within my own family. But, you know, in all honesty, there was lots of things, moments where I had to be honest with myself and say, you know, how many Black people are actually in my life? And who do I build with? And how embarrassing is it that I haven't built um, deeper relationships with a lot of other Black folk in this community, right? So on the one hand, I, I think about the part I have to do. And the other part I have to think about is um, where have I fallen through, you know, being somebody who's active in the community and also has shortfalls, because I do. Um, I think the other part that I really had to lean into was the concept of self-compassion, right? Um, we are wired almost to, to rely on self-criticism as a motivator to do better in the world. And self-criticism doesn't always work. It often doesn't work to make us better at our jobs or to make us better friends or to make us better partners. Um, and so when we think about self-compassion um, and just acknowledging like what our bodies can do and can't do, I think that's enough, you know? So, you know, people in communities I'm working with are struggling with body image. And of course I am too, right? Like I'm like going through all the motions and I created a bunch of post-its that went in around my house that said, you know what? Um, one of them was uh, replace, when it comes to food, replace guilt with gratitude. Uh, when it comes to uh, alcohol, the goal isn't a sobriety. It's, it's about less impulsivity between sips. Like these are like, I, I, I was in it with people and I continue to be in it and I had to come up with strategies that worked for me, um, but I drew on self-compassion. So thanks for that, Matea. Does anybody, if anybody else wants to go, go ahead. No, that was a thank you, sorry. <laughs> oh, thank you, Matea. Does anybody else want to unmute themselves and ch chime in? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, hi, ahead, this is Shane. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I graduated, uh, I did my undergrad and I finished in April or whatever this year, right in the middle of the pandemic. And uh, until you said something, I didn't realize that the grief and rumination that I was feeling uh, could be so heavily tied to COVID and the pandemic. Um, and it's really given me this, this framework that I didn't uh, realize that I needed before. Uh, so I don't really have a question or anything, but um, I just want to say thank you because I've really taken uh, something great out of this workshop. Thanks so, thanks so much for that, Shane. Even if it's, uh, you know, it's not a question, but it really, um, it, re it reinforces for me um, 
like this idea that, you know, uh, that perhaps we need to talk more about grief <laughs> and ambiguous grief and what it means in our lives, you know, and how ruminating, sometimes just carving out space to think about our lives is part of grief processing. You know, we're letting something go and inviting something new. And to be clear, we're grieving all the time. You know, anytime I, you know, uh, you know, a parent of mine disappoints me with something, they say I'm grieving. Uh, anytime I go on a date and the person is not who I thought they would be, I'm grieving. My ex I'm always grieving an expectation of something I thought could be, you know? Um, so thank you for that. Other folks, we still got a couple more minutes. We are the last uh, event for today. We've still got about 50 people in this chat. Um, go ahead, Shane. Oh, who's, yes, go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Yohei. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, the, mine is not question either, but I just wanted to share that um, so many things you said have resonated with me because um, I'm a choir director. I direct uh, Game and Scorers here in Atlantic Canada, mm -hmm. and it has been difficult for the choir and for myself and Sometimes um, as a choir leader, I feel that I should be caring more for my choir members, but there are moments I feel, I, I'm, I'm worried about myself that I don't have the capacity to do so. Mm -hmm. And recently the um, rehearsals have been difficult because many people don't show up because everything is online and sometimes I do feel that comments that come from other members I can talk about this because none of my choir members is here <laughs> but um, um, I know they they intend good things but so many opinions come at me and I had one rehearsal a few weeks ago that I stopped saying and I said okay just move on and we finished the rehearsal earlier and I was feeling this, um, I don't know what's going to happen to my choir. I don't know what's going to happen to myself. I don't know if I, if I can stay in Canada or not because I don't have permanent residency. And all that becomes really difficult yeah. to deal with. Absolutely. So, um, but at the same time, I was feeling like I'm not a good leader because I'm not, I have been honest, honestly, I have been procrastinating some things about my choir because I just didn't have mental space to think about it. Totally, totally. So um, in a way that in this talk, I could see that I was not only, I was not alone in this, like many people are feeling something like that. So it comforted me a little bit. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. You know, Yohei, I, um, I do community organizing with a group called Salam Canada. And I had so many things on my docket to do, and I dropped the ball on just about everything. And you know what helped me was to confide in somebody who is from the community and say, you know what, I've been having a lot of trouble and I feel like I'm letting people down. And that person said, we're in the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> it's okay to take care of yourself. And I think, uh, I think sharing something with a confidant or somebody who can, you know, who can listen. And just hearing someone say, it's okay, you know, we're all going through it, people understand, it can just relieve so much pressure. You know, I think taking leadership roles is admirable and it's useful and it serves, it serves me, it serves you, it gives us meaning. Um, and I think it's, um, this is a time where we kind of have to say, you know what, I rely on this for a lot of me meaning, but it's not something I can draw from at the moment, right? And I can't draw from it. So if it doesn't energize me, there's nothing for me to give, right? It has to be a feedback cycle where I give and I see positive responses from other people and that re-energizes me. And that cycle has been severely disrupted. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Um, maybe we'll take it, for, we'll, okay, we'll do one more if there is. Otherwise, we'll end here. Yes, go Hello? ahead. Joy. Yes, hi, Joy. Hi. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, speak from the perspective of someone who had already had clinical depression going yeah. into the pandemic in the first place and how those symptoms just are 
just turned up to a million. Yes. And and it just feels like everything is is falling apart. And um uh just that like what's gonna happen, what's gonna happen. We 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 don't know anything. Yeah. And it's a, such an uncomfortable place to be. Yes. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, Joy, you know, um, I'm also somebody that's on SSRIs. And uh, I also wondered, like, do we need to up the dose? Like, what's going on here? Um, <clears throat> and I think, like, I, I don't want to, uh, I wouldn't, I don't want to suggest, you know, like, whose depression is harder or, or easier. Like, I, I don't know, you know, but um, if, if a person's having a tough go at it um, and they're already on medication and, you know, they know that they have clinical depression, um, I think in everyday world, in everyday land, I think people can be dismissive about invisible disabilities. Um, they don't see them as chronic illness or, or they don't see them as episodic disabilities when others of us know that they can be debilitating. And then in the context of a pandemic, um, I think people in many ways have like, they run out of empathy or they feel like, oh, I'm going through the same thing you're going through. Why are you having a harder time? And there's, there's a piece that they don't get. And so I think getting empathy is harder when people are maxed out. Um, uh, emotionally. And Joy, I don't know if that was your experience or not, where your isolation increased because people just weren't there. Hello, Rahim. Rahim, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Sorry, I just want to give, Joy, did that answer, was that Sorry. what you were looking for? Yeah, and just that that ambiguity, ambiguity of time and then yeah. taking medication when you're supposed to falls off. Everything just falls off the rails. It's just, oh. Yes. <laughs> I hear that. I hear that so hard. Thank you so much for sharing, Joy. Um, Ed, why don't we make you our last uh, contributor today? Oh, thank you so much. Um, I actually wanted to tell you that I am one of the um, uh, nominees artists who um, are chosen uh, for this workshop, actually. Oh. I, I am House Initiative for Men, so I'm going to be making an artwork uh, inspired by your uh, uh, workshop. Okay, so I love I have, that. I have something interesting. Like I, I, I'm so interested with this. Um, okay. And I have um, imagined something that I'd like to discuss with you, which is I people consider home as a safe place, usually just to share things and to, uh, you know, to, to be themselves. And, and it's a safer place. So uh -huh. I can, I need to ask um, this question, where can people find energy and safe place away from that place where it became like distracted somehow? Like we all now in homes and it's kind of, kind of the, you know, like it was a good place and now it becomes like a place of a, it raises a lot of questions about it. Some people deal with it very well and other yes. people do not deal. So how do you find this? Can you explain to me? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a hard question. I mean, I'm sure there's, right, at the moment, we've got 42 people in this room. I'm sure they all have a different response. Um, for me, I would say um, I had to go back to basics, right? If I'm saying that I, I'm losing energy and I don't have space to think, and then I think about, A, how do I create mental space? And B, uh, what conditions do I need to be able to access that, like to access rationality and rational thought and so for me um finding a way to exercise and as an extrovert finding a way to be in contact with people um does something really beautiful for 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 my own psyche and my own wellness and so uh no matter what i have to find a way to do that and so i you know for me i uh, my ex-partner has custody of our dog and i was like you need to bring her over and i need to take her <laughs> for several weeks at a time and you know being with animals walking in like for you know at least an hour a day that really helped me um and i know that um things like that aren't possible for everybody but i think we need to figure out what it is that's going to be re-energizing you know before this pandemic i'll be honest even as a therapist uh 10 years into being a therapist um i did very little in the way of self-care and what i thought was self-care was actually um you know uh, a kind of fun and debauchery to, to compensate for how little time I had for fun. So I was working hard and partying hard and that's great while it lasts, but it's not a sustainable way to be in the world, at least not for me. 
And so, uh, I, you know, slowing down, investing time in food, uh, and really thinking about the system we operate in was helpful for me. You know, I thought for so long, is it worth it for me to make food and make my own coffee in the morning when like that takes away from time that I could be working? That's a kind of internalized capitalist garbage that, you know, I internalize and I think so many people have, right? And I think one of the ways we are going to get more energized is if we're able to rework and be critical of the system we operate in. Because the system we operate in is like, it's kind of a dirty capitalist machine that has force fed us a lot of things um, that are designed to suck our energy, are designed to keep us reliant on products to make our lives better. Um, and they're not necessarily supportive of our, like our, our spiritual or, or personal growth. So hopefully that's helpful, but I would say, I think lots of people are gonna have different answers for what's yeah. re-energizing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for this. I You're just, very welcome. Uh, and coffee. Somebody just like. <laughs> like yes. Coffee. coffee is very important. Thank All you. Right. So You're welcome. I'm going to thank everyone for tuning in. And, you know, there's some of you who, who, who have sent me private messages to say that you've been to multiple workshops of mine. And, 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 and I really appreciate that. Um, I'd love to keep the conversation going. If you want to get in touch with me or you want to follow me on any of my social media things, um, allmylinks.com forward slash Lady Edivan. Um, and I'd love to be in conversation with you. Um, I probably won't um, respond right away. I'm probably gonna respond when I'm able to emotionally respond in, in, in a genuine and heartfelt way. I'm always happy to, to share my slides and I look forward to being in community with all of you again in person. Take good care and I hope, thank you for having me at the summit.